Um, but let's get to the main event tonight. I'm so psyched to have Ash here. Um, he, he doesn't live here. He lives in Austin, and he happened to be in town. The timing worked out great. Who here has heard of Ash Moria yeah? before? Exactly. Yeah. So um, well, where did we start? So first and foremost, he created the Lean Canvas that I'm sure a lot of you guys have used before. He wrote this great book, Running Lean. It actually came out before Eric Reese's book came out. So I think it might be the first official Lean Startup book out there. It's a great book, packed with a lot of great information. He's CEO of Lean Stack. Before that, he was CEO of the startup Wired Reach. Um, and his new book is coming out the 14th, I think, is it? 14th, so today is the 8th or 9th, so within a week, it's gonna be out. Um, you guys are all gonna get, because you guys, for five extra dollars more than our normal meetup, I think that's a pretty, pretty freaking good deal for this thing. Anyway, you're gonna get this mailed to you when it comes out, so. And he's gonna be sharing all kinds of advice about it. Um, and his Twitter signal sign again is at Ash Mori. I couldn't be more happy to have Ash here. Thanks a lot for coming. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Yes, thank you, Dan. Yeah. Nope, did it, sweet. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Right. So, I've been an entrepreneur for over a decade. Um, as many of you know, I've been following me. I've, I've been in a couple of different startups, built a dozen or so products along the way. Now, like a lot of people, all my ideas started out as awesome ideas, which I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, not all of them went on to become awesome products or awesome business models. And like anyone else, I wanted my products to be more successful, the ones that didn't. Um, so I wanted to have more successes and failures, but I was prepared for the journey. I knew that good ideas are rare and hard to find, and you have to go through a lot of stuff that doesn't work before you find the few nuggets that actually do work. So I was prepared for the search process, and that's not what really bothered me. What bothered me more was the cycle time, so the cycle time between my ideas. So at that time, I was averaging about a year and a half to two years from the moment I had the spark of the idea to the point when I knew whether I was going to keep the idea or double down on, and double down on the idea or, or get rid of it. And that was frankly too long because at some point I realized I wasn't going to get any younger. Was, you know, time doesn't wait for anyone. Um, and I had more ideas and I had time and resources to act on all of them. So that became my personal mantra. Life's too short to build something nobody wants. And I started my search for better and faster ways to vet these tons of ideas that were kind of bouncing around in my head. And that's what brought me to the Lean Startup. That's what got me excited about what Eric Reese was doing, what Steve Blank were doing. And a lot of what they were saying resonated very strongly with me. And so I decided to run kind of my own series of experiments and explorations. And fundamentally, I was trying to understand why do products really fail? So we know that products have dismal success rates, not just in startups, but also in the enterprise corporate world. It's, it's rampant everywhere. But why does that really happen? And I found that my story was not unique. I was finding everyone else making the same fundamental uh, mistake, or I would say playing out the story over and over again. So when we get hit by the ideas, I'm going to show the prototypical entrepreneur, innovator, maker. When we get hit by an idea, we do one of two things. The first thing we do is we lock ourselves up in the metaphorical garage and we start building out our solution because that's we feel if we get that solution out in the open, everything else takes care of itself. At some point, we start looking like that because things take longer than we expect. Uh, we need more help, we need more team members, we need more resources. And so we surface out and then go look for people with bags of money. These could be investors, these could be your stakeholders in your company, and we try to pitch them on the solution and often get the polite no. This is actually a pretty apparent no, but you often get the polite no. And so I argue, I argue that this is a backwards approach. Starting with a build first or an investor first approach is not the right way to go about this. And the reason for that is that when you just start with the solution, people don't necessarily see what you see. And so when you go to an investor or a stakeholder and pitch your idea, you're really pitching a solution and they want to see the full business model story. They want to see how does this get a return on investment, what is kind of that backstory behind your idea. Oftentimes at this stage, you go looking for customers because that's the next best thing to do. But when you show them a half-finished product like this one and have them take that first test flight, they also politely or very adamantly say no because they don't want to be guinea pigs in your experiment. So they don't also see what you see. And they fundamentally want to know what is the problem that you are solving, not so much what is the solution that you are pitching them. 
So at this point, we throw our hands up in the air, and that's kind of the story that I saw playing out over and over again. Now, there is a better way. So we have to start by understanding fundamentally why does this happen. So when we look at the number one reasons why products fail, it's very simple. It's because we simply spend needless time, money, and effort chasing the wrong product. We ultimately build something that not enough people want, and that is the top reason. There are many kind of symptoms of that. We run out of money. We kind of lose our team members because when you don't have traction, people don't stay with you. So there are many secondary reasons why we say products fail, but I found this to be the fundamental one is we end up building that wrong product. Again, we should ask ourselves why this happens, and I put the blame on ourselves. So we, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the makers, fall in love with our solutions. So when we see our business or our idea, the thing that comes most clearly to, uh, most clearly to us is that solution box, what I show here is awesome, and that is what I call the innovator's bias. So we, we lead with our solutions, we think that's all we, we have to build, and for me, that was a transformational epiphany that I had several years ago. Is I have, came from a technical background. I was a, I was a software uh, developer, then I became a technical founder, I started my own companies. And one of the things I realized is that building great solutions, while it's a very important part of the story, it's not the only thing. It's one small part of the true product that you're building. So your solution kind of fits in this canvas, which I'll unravel for those that don't know what the Lean Canvas is. But it's a small part of the overall business model, and that is your true product. And this was the epiphany that I had several years ago, and that's what sparked me to kind of write the running lean book. Um, that was one of the core messages, and then a lot of the how was really all about how do you really build that business model through lean startup techniques, through customer development techniques. So maybe a show of hands, I asked this question uh, when you guys were all registering, but I didn't see all the, all the latest counts. Um, how many of you have read the book Running Lean? Maybe with a show of hands. It's so about half of you, so not all of you, and so that's why I titled this talk from running lean to scaling lean. So we're going to spend a little bit of time catching everyone up because it's important to get the vocabulary right and kind of give you the frame to then talk about what's new in the next book. So in running lean, these were the core meta principles that I was really trying to get out. Um, so when you go about building a product that people want, you have to start with documenting your initial plan. You have to start with that plan A. Even though it may not be where you end up, we have to draw a line in the sand and start with something. And so that in some ways is like the scientific method. We want to make sure that we declare our outcomes up front. We are, we are, we're setting up certain expectations which we then test against. Um, no different than, so this, if the, I know many people here are product, product folks. If you look at the meta principles and just scan them, it's no different than product best practices applied to the business model as a product. And that was what I was, I was going against. So just like with any complicated product, if you're trying to build a house, you don't start with just putting up walls and see what happens. You have some kind of a plan, some kind of a blueprint. And that was what that first meta principle was all about. Now, in the business world, the way we, we do planning traditionally has been with the business plan. So how many of you here have written a business plan before? Maybe show of hands. And keep your hands up if you enjoy that process. <laughs> so actually, here, no hands stay up. Sometimes I have a few people who like, who like torture. Um, so again, I'm not so much, I, I think the business plan is a good intended exercise. The problem is that the people who make you write these business plans don't take the requisite time to really interact with them. They don't really read them. They don't really interact with you in a way that's meaningful. And so that's what, ma that's what makes it a wasteful exercise. You spend all this time creating a 60-page document, pretty charts, nice Excel spreadsheets, um, but at the end of the day, people don't, don't critique it enough, and that's, that's the problem. So again, I want to make a distinction. I'm not against business planning. I think business planning is very important. The business plan format by itself is broken. So if you have no plan, which is the other extreme, that's the, 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 the trap that I see a lot of people running, running into is they don't create a business plan, they don't have any plan, and that's the just do it attitude. That's where we don't hold ourselves accountable and we start going around in circles. So we don't want to do that, and that's why the business model canvas, the lean canvas, is a nice, happy medium that kind of fits in the middle. So it's not as long as a business plan, but it's also not a no plan. It kind of captures just enough about the business. Not everything, it, because it fits in a single page, it can capture every aspect of your business, but it captures just enough to where you can have a meaningful conversation, and that's the key point. So if you've never seen the Lean Canvas before, this is what it looks like. It is just that size, so it's got a lot of the common building blocks that you would find in a business plan. Uh, things like who are, my, who are my customers, what problems 
Are they, are they encountering how do I build a solution? How do I go to market? So you can answer all of those types of questions with just a single page Lean Canvas. So I liken the building blocks in the Lean Canvas a lot to Lego pieces. We can configure those building blocks to build and describe some very simple models like this. We can use those same fundamental building blocks to describe more elaborate models like this one. And this was actually a life-size X-Wing fighter, not built with giant Lego pieces, but those same small Lego pieces. Um, so we'll, we'll see some examples of this, how we can take the building blocks in the Lean Canvas and describe some simple coffee shop types of examples. We'll go to multi-sided markets and marketplace models and kind of show you how you can, you can talk about them. So that's step one, is you have got to draw a line in the sand. So take your, take, create a blueprint of your business, which is the Lean Canvas. The next step in the process here is one of identifying what's riskiest. So again, a lot of you are product people. If you had six months to build a product, you wouldn't start with the easy stuff because that, that comes easy. You, would, you wouldn't spend the first five months on the easy stuff and then leave the hard stuff for later. You would flip that around. We kind of lose that logic when we work with our businesses because building stuff sometimes comes easier to us and we spend a lot of time locked up building the product instead of asking the harder questions, if we build this, will anyone care? And who will care and at what price point and does that, does that make sense for us? So those are the fundamentally the questions you need to be asking. I have this picture here because it reminds, the, the whole idea of the riskiest assumption reminds me of the game of Jenga. So when you're playing Jenga, what's the strategy? We're going for kind of the easy pieces because we want to make sure the, 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 uh, the pillar is solid. But as an entrepreneur, you want to do the exact opposite. You want to, in a controlled manner, figure out what the weakest pieces are and knock them out first and then rebuild the tower so it's much, much stronger. So we're using that sort of control destruction to actually create something a lot more a lot more powerful and a lot more stronger that can stand the test of time. The last part of the running lean process is one of running experiments to test your risks. So this is where the lean startup fits very nicely. Uh, the build, measure, learn loop that Eric Ries codified is a way of taking some of those riskiest assumptions and very quickly crafting some experiments, getting feedback, and that feedback is the feedback loop that informs your risks and then informs your business model. And so as you go from left to right, you start with your idea, but by the time you're done enough of those cycles, you actually get to hopefully a business model that starts to work. So that was kind of running lean in a nutshell. To kind of put this into more context, it's good to share some case studies which we'll kind of workshop here as a group. So the first example I'd like to bring up is one of starting a restaurant. So if you were starting a restaurant, restaurateurs are no different than entrepreneurs. They've got big visions of their restaurant. Many of them have picked out the menu, they've picked out the silverware, they've picked out the napkins, uh, they've picked out the location. The only thing they need it now is just money to go open the restaurant. Now, I would argue that a lot of those things in there are forms of premature optimization. So we, they're always thinking again of their solution, but you fundamentally need to ask yourself this question. So if you were a rent restaurateur, what would you say is, are, are the more riskier assumptions that you'd want to test up front? Anyone want to throw out some things? Will people show up? Anything else? The type of food you're going to be responsible for. Sure. Yeah, the type of food. Price points. What, what was that? Price points. Price points. Yeah, so all of those are, are kind of right on. Um, so this is a definitely a very advanced crowd. Um, because I sometimes will hear, you know, think, I already talked about location, but sometimes people will talk about location. And the problem with location is that, yes, all things being equal, a good location and a good restaurant go well together. But you can have bad restaurants and good locations. And so that's not a given. But fundamentally, if you're talking about the value proposition, at least in this part of the world, people don't starve. You know, people have lots of choices. Uh, when they go to a restaurant, they can pick from among many different food types. And so you fundamentally have to ask yourself, what's your differentiation from all the existing alternatives? And not just can I get people's interest, but will they come and consume my food not once but repeatedly? And can I actually charge money for that? So all of those things should be tested. You don't need a brick and mortar restaurant to test that. You could, uh, I guess to start, you could actually invite friends over to your place, and if they start asking you where you catered the food from, that's already a telltale sign that maybe your food's at a different level. You may then go into catering, you may open a pop-up pop restaurant, which was popular a few years ago, but in more recent times, we have got this innovation, the food truck, which is a fast way of testing a restaurant without having to build a restaurant. So this is a great lean example of how you may take a risky idea, like I've got a new concept uh, food, and go out and test it. This used to be only used for cheap street food, but now many high-end restaurateurs, at least in Austin, and I'm sure here as well, 
are starting to use this literally as a vehicle for testing their ideas. So you can get one of these. You don't even have to buy them now. You can rent them, and within a week, you're up and running. You can drive them around and test different locations. You can tweet where you are, which is exactly what these guys did. So in Texas, where I live, I live in Austin, um, barbecue and tacos is pretty big. These guys innovated by adding a Korean fusion to that. And they drove it around town and created a very popular uh, food truck and then opened brick and mortar locations where they got the most engagement. Uh, but this by far is my best uh, story of kind of, the, of, 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 a, of a food truck example. This, this is a couple, uh, Aaron Franklin and his wife, Stacy, and they were um, starving artists. Like they were below the poverty line when they, when they opened this food truck. Um, they managed to scrape enough dollars to get one of these food trucks. It's not even a food truck, it's a trailer that you drag behind. And they convinced their friend uh, to give them some empty space. It was a rundown gas station under the highway, so terrible location. Unless you knew where this was, you were not going to find this place. But despite that, again, Texas is big in, uh, I'm sorry, barbecue is big in Texas. So once a good uh, brisket place opens up, word gets out very quickly. So within two weeks, this started to happen. There were lines out the door before the restaurant even opened. Um, you can't see very well, but in there, there's somebody taking a picture of the line. It might have been Aaron Franklin, because uh, he was surprised and he was happy that you know, this line is forming. So word got out very quickly. It only took two weeks for this to happen, and the line was out the door. And after that, you know, the line just kept getting longer and longer, and they started selling out before they even opened, because they could only make so much meat. And so they would go and count off the people, and they had a last man standing sign, because that was your, that was the guarantee that this person would get food, but you may not, so you may want to want to leave. Um, and word got out even further. Pretty soon, we had uh, Anthony Bourdain, who some of you will recognize, came by, and he tried the food and loved it. And of course, after that, the, the lines got even longer. Um, he got a James Beard Award uh, in, in, uh, in Austin. Um, Aaron Franklin wrote a cookbook. He also did some cameo appearances in some movies. Uh, the Chef, if you've seen, is the food truck movie. He actually has a cameo appearance in there. Um, so he got pretty famous. Even the President of the United States paid an, a visit. He didn't have to stand in line. He managed to just cut the line, which was uh, maybe not fair to people in line. But he did have to pay, which he wasn't too happy about, as you can see there. So he was, uh, Aaron was still running a good business, so he still had the president pay. So again, I, I like this story because it illustrates a lot of the things we typically think. We need to think about scale, we need to think about you know, how do we get our story out there, and all those things are premature optimization in the beginning. You have to focus on the fundamentals, which is really who is my customer, what are they consuming today, how do I create value for them, how do I then capture value from them, and then scale comes after that. So we'll go to a different story. So we'll go to kind of the high-tech world. If we look at Tesla, they also had a very big vision, um, or I would say a bigger vision than the food truck. Uh, they had a vision of creating a mainstream all-electric vehicle, uh, which they are now starting to realize or starting to at least uh, roll that out and talk about it. But that's not where they started. Um, so if we went back in Tesla's history, and some of you might have followed the story, and you know the cars they launched, what would you say was their riskiest assumption in the beginning? The batteries, that's a solution. But what was the, what was the battery duration. solving? Yes, yeah, the duration or range. Yeah, so, they were, so again, just like in the food truck example, or in the food example, you want to ask yourself, if you are building an all-electric car, what are people consuming today? What are they using today? And so they were using gas-powered vehicles, and all of them on a full tank could go 200 to 300 miles. If you came along and created an all-electric vehicle and said, you know, this is a green car, it's a sports car, you know, it can do all the things, but it only goes 30 miles on the charge, that would be a no-go, it would be a non-starter, because people would get stranded, they would ask about how they get the charging stations, how long they would take, and it would, just not, it would just not fly. So they knew that they had to fix that problem. Now, they were hybrid solutions, but they were not pure electric cars. They wanted to build a 100% electric car that could go far. And so someone threw out batteries, and that's exactly right. So the way they had to solve that problem was not by building a better car, but building a better battery. And so when you're building a better battery, you don't even need to build a car. And that is kind of the, the part of this, this, this story, is that they purposefully went the route of licensing a body style, the Lotus body style, uh, from, from Lotus, and took out its guts and put their battery in there. And that was the initial Tesla Roadster. Again, it, it, when you start to embrace what's riskiest, it, it changes your whole perspective on how you build products. So they, this, was not where they, this was not where they wanted to end up. So people might wonder, uh, why did they pick the Lotus? 
and if you kind of think about it, uh, if they had picked a, if they had gone into an all electric car from the beginning that was affordable, one, a very hard problem to solve, but two, the demand for it, as we know from the recent announcement, would be through the roof. A lot of people may try to order it, and they have to start tackling with all the scale issues. They'd have to have, to have factories built, they'd have to have um, uh, charging stations and the infrastructure built, but by going this route, they, they could only make, they only had to make a few of these cars because one, they were premium and high priced, very expensive, and so they could limit the amount of cars they needed to have in the market, and that allowed them to progressively scale up. And you'll kind of see this pattern over and over again. Facebook kind of did the same thing with a scaled launch versus doing an all-out launch like their competitors. And I'd argue that that in many ways allowed them to build a better product faster than the alternative. So you'll kind of see this theme kind of come back again. But this was the catching up part for everyone who has, uh, has, has not read Running Lean. That's kind of what was in Running Lean. And kind of how you might think of a product and figure out what might be riskiest in it and then build out a, a, a plan to go uh, implement that. So why another book? So if I looked at, um, I believe that startups are built through a bunch of conversations. Um, we're not, we don't build these in isolations. We have conversations with our customers. These are not your focus group and surveys types of things. There's actually a, a way to go and extract what customers want, not by simply asking them. So Steve Jobs nailed it when he said the customer's job is not to know what they want. That's really our jobs to go figure that out. So there's a whole language, and that's what a lot of the customer development and customer discovery techniques are all about. Um, whether you use interviews or observation, you want to go understand who your customers are, what they're doing today, how they're solving problems today, and those give you insights on what problems to go tackle. Um, we also have different kinds of conversations with teams, advisors, um, investors. And so my first book, Running Lean, was mostly focused on the epiphany I showed you, which was the business model is the product, and how to then engage customers to figure out how to roll out that business model initially. Now since then, once the book came out, lots of people got outside the building, they started running interviews, they started getting all this learning, and then they came back inside the building and talked to their stakeholders, and the stakeholders said, all that learning is great, but I still don't see the business model. And so that was what I kept hearing back from, from people who were doing all the learning, and that's why I say learning is not enough. Um, and I see this myself. When I walk to people, they point to my book, they point to the stacks of interview notes, they, they point to all the learning, and they tell me you should be so proud that we're we are following all of this you know, customer development stuff. And I'm like, yes, that's great, it's commendable because it is behavior change, it is hard. But my next question is, so how many customers did you sign up? And when the number is a disappointing zero, that's, that's not progress. So I, I'm, I'm kind of in the camp of the stakeholders is that learning by itself is not enough. We have to turn that learning into business model results, otherwise it's just pursuing uh, a, a trivia, it's, it's more like a trivia pursuit. So learning works internally when we talk with our teams, and in the Lean Startup we talk a lot about learning and validated learning, and that all works, but when we go outside and we start talking to investors or stakeholders, if the learning isn't enough, we start to spin numbers. We start to figure out what numbers can we put up there that makes our business model look believable, and to me that's not progress. We need to find a single metric that we can use both internally and externally, and that was one of the things I wanted to try to find in the next book. So the next book really focuses on, on what is that conversation from entrepreneur to stakeholder, how do we talk about problems worth solving, um, and how do we come back inside the building and get consensus from our teams, even within our, with, with our teams, what metrics do we track internally, and how can we use those same metrics externally without having to play success theater, without having to do all the spinning of numbers that we talk about uh, in the Lean Startup, uh, kind of as, as vanity metrics. The other thing I found is that you have to build some other tools beyond the Lean Canvas. So the Lean Canvas is a great tool for getting the business model story out, but that by itself is not enough. So when we go into the, um, into the business plan world, we have the story in the pages in the business plan, but then we also have the Excel spreadsheets, the forecasts, and so there needs to be some equivalent of that. And so that's another thing that I kind of introduced in the second book, is how can you use a forecasting model for your idea um, using a few numbers. So it's not about the thousands of numbers in the spreadsheet, but how can you use just a few key inputs to start to model in um, traction or, or, get, or get as close to describing traction as you possibly can. And then the third goal that I had was identifying what's riskiest. So I already illustrated how with some businesses like restaurants and Tesla, we can start with 
risks and then kind of move from there. And with enough practice, you can f identify the starting risks rather simply because they're usually around your customer problem solution assumptions. But as your product gets out there, no two entrepreneurs are the same, no two products are the same. And so you're going to be dealing with all kinds of risks that come at you at every different direction. And so there needs to be a more systematic way for finding that. And that's where I found a lot of people falling, is they were able to get started, but once the MVP was built, uh, they then kind of lost focus and were just pursuing the wrong things at the wrong time. So how do we pursue the right actions at the right time was the third goal that was something I wanted to target in Scaling Lean. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is preview kind of the three parts of the book and talk about some of these things and highlight how, that, uh, that's the, how, how I, how I, how I uh, attempt to solve some of those questions or answer some of those questions. So we'll, like running lean, it's broken into three parts. We'll start with the first one, which is defining progress. And fundamentally, we want to ask ourselves a very basic question, which is what is it that both entrepreneurs and investors want? If we can answer that question, we can begin to start to figure out what is that single metric of progress. So anyone want to throw out what is it that both entrepreneurs and, and investors want? Customers. Customers, yes. Revenue. Revenue. Profit track, yes. It's, in some ways, it's all, it's all of the above. So we, we'd, we'd like to show this um, both internally and externally. We'd like to show not just customers, but the rate at which we're, we're bringing customers, not just uh, revenue, but the rate of that going up. So revenue is great. If I've got $1,000 uh, today, that's great. But tomorrow, if that drops to zero, that's, that's not so good. So we want to show the, the kind of the rate of growth. And so we often call this the traction picture or the hockey stick curve picture. And it makes us happy because it shows you know, good things happening. The bad news, though, is that traction can be gamed. So if I show you two graphs, this one or this one, which one would you prefer? A lot of people would say the one on the left-hand side. But this is the exact same data set, just drawn differently. So one is a cumulative number of signups kind of since the beginning of time. And that's your classic lean startup vanity metric. The other one is the same data set, just shown month over month. And you can see that the story hasn't really changed all that much. Uh, but in the first one, we can give the impression that we are growing like crazy and we're making a lot of progress. So the bad news, so, so the good news is that this used to work several years ago. It doesn't work anymore. That's the bad news. Many of the uh, investors, advisors have gotten a lot more sophisticated. So they can look, they can see through the facade of these vanity metrics. So we have to fundamentally ask ourselves, what is the right traction metric and stop playing the games with the charts. Uh, but really get to what is traction fundamentally. So since I'm a business model guy, I talk a lot about in, I, I, I talk a lot about progress in terms of business models. And so to me, the output of the business model is really how we should define traction. And I like this particular defini definition of a business model is it's a story that describes how you create, deliver, and capture value. The first thing to realize is that all of this value is not value for you. It's really value for your customers. And so the y-axis on that traction graph has to measure some customer behavior. It's not enough to say we've got you know, a million dollars in the bank, or we've got a bigger office now, or we've got a bigger team now. That's not traction. Those may be side effects of traction, but you have to really figure out what are those customer behaviors that lead to traction or that, or that, that are measured as traction. The next thing I want to point out is if we take those three jobs of the business model and put them side by side, two sets of equations have to hold true for every business. The first one is what I call the value equation. So you have to create more value for your customers than you capture back from them. Um, and that one is maybe easy to understand. If I go to a coffee shop and they tell me the coffee is $10, I may not buy it because I don't think the perceived value of that coffee is worth $10. So that's the value equation. If you don't have that, your business model is a non-starter. No one will come and buy your products. So the second part of the equation is just as important. This is the monetization or the sustainability equation. So the, your costs have to be less than your, than your revenue. That's essentially what that is showing. And I have a greater than or equal to there because uh, we have not-for-profits in the room who aren't driven by profits. They still should drive for profit, but then reinvest all the profit to maybe have a bigger impact in the business. So these are the two equations that hold true. In the lean approach, we don't tackle this all at once. We do them in stages. So we first start by creating value for customers. That is the value hypothesis. That's the most important thing to first test out. Will anyone care if you put your product out there? What is that value proposition? We then start to get into that second part where we figure out, um, 
can we actually capture some of that value back? So can we charge for this product if we aren't charging directly? Who's the, who's the customer? We ask those questions. And then finally, we start to optimize the business model, and that's kind of the monetization equation part there. But the key part to kind of point out here is that capturing value is a very critical part of both of these equations, and that is what I use in my definition of traction. So to me, traction is the rate at which a business model creates, mon uh, captures monetizable value from its customers. And it's important to point out that monetizable value is not the same thing as revenue. So revenue is really a side effect of something else, and we'll see this illustrated with a few business model types. So it's not all about current revenue, because revenue is a side effect of this monetizable activity, which we will talk about here in a second. But the other thing to realize is that it's also not about being current. It's not about current anything. It's about future business model growth. So again, if I go to you and say, would you invest in Apple? The stock is trading at, say, $1,000. That would be kind of a silly question to ask, because you would, you, the right question to ask is, where was it three months ago? Where do you think it's going to be three months from now? So again, traction is a rate. It's not a single point in time. And that's the other part of this, of this statement. So let's apply this to a few business model types and try to make it more concrete. So there are lots of business model types. We'll be here all night if we cover every one of them. So I'll take a shortcut. I'm going to use an archetype of a business model, a pattern uh, that can be applied to many different business model types. So I like to model my businesses in terms of the number of actors in them. So if you've got a one-actor model, that's a direct business model. If you've got multi-actors, it could be a multi-sided or a marketplace model. And so we'll start with these three. And if you've got questions, we can go to many other business model types. So in a direct business model, the job that we have is pretty simple. We take these unaware visitors on the left-hand side, and we work through the magic that's shown here in the black box to create happy customers on the right-hand side. Um, and when I say happy customers, I'm not just talking about an emotional state. I'm talking about getting results for them. So, I, so there's a difference between making happy customers and making customers happy. So I can make you guys happy by, you know, we got some pizza here, there's beer, we'll give some stickers out later and some books. That may make you happy, but it doesn't make you, uh, it, it doesn't get you results. And so when I get you results, that is the act of making happy customers. So happiness is more driven by the results you get rather than just that state of, state of uh, emotion. Um, the other point to, to kind of raise here is I, I talked about Starbucks as an example. So let's talk about the Starbucks story. So Starbucks kind of has the same job. It takes unaware visitors on the left. If you've never been to Starbucks before, you may go in there, um, smell the coffee, like the ambience, buy something, and then you become a customer. And so their job is to convert as many of those unaware visitors into customers. And so traction of that very simple, in that simple business model is the rate at which they create customers. And so that's just a... A, a metaphor that we will kind of build on here in a, in a, few, in a few seconds. Um, but the thing to really ask is not so much what is traction in this business model, because it's obvious, but rather what led to that. And so if you go back in Starbucks history, they actually began to notice a very interesting pattern, is they found that there was a small segment of their customers that were behaving very differently. So they were a coffee shop, and like every, every coffee shop, people would come buy coffee and leave. But there was a small segment of their, their customer base they would buy the coffee and then go and sit on these uncomfortable couches. And then they would start having meetings and they would start you know, talking, to their people, talking to people and come back and buy more coffee. And they just kept doing this and they actually ended up spending more money. So they found that time spent in store actually correlated with, amount, with, with revenue also, also generated from those customers. And that's when they had this insight, what if we redefine what the coffee shop is all about? It's not just about coffee. People are not just hiring us to give them a cup of coffee. They're hiring us also for the space. And so they, they upgraded their stores, put comfortable couches, put some artwork. Um, at some point, they got free Wi-Fi. They unlocked the, the bathrooms. And so they made it a comfortable place. And they actually welcomed you. They rebranded themselves as the third space between your home and an office. And they welcomed you to come and spend more time. And that did very well for their business model. So they've now uh, even expanded further. They, they have coffee, I'm sorry, they have uh, beer and wine in some of the locations. I don't know if it's, if it's all over. Uh, but they, they're getting into the space of getting you in the morning, getting in the evening, uh, getting you in the day. So they want you to come and spend time with them because the more time you spend, the more money they also capture from you. So again, in, in that story, what we want to find are those leading indicators. So what are the behaviors from customers that we can use that help us predict what future revenue is. So it was not about Starbucks current revenue, but how do you get more future revenue? So let's apply this to a multi-sided model. So we'll use Facebook here. So in a multi-sided model, you have users and customers. 
Typically, your users are not paying. So in Facebook, we all use Facebook, but we don't pay them directly. But I argue there's no such thing as a free user. So even with Facebook, we are all paying Facebook. What are we paying them with? With, with attention, privacy, data, all, all, all of the above. Um, and so Facebook is, is very smart about that, is they get you what you want. So you, you get to talk to your friends. You get to do the things you want. But in exchange, they're collecting bre a breadcrumb trail of where you go around the web. Um, they are collect, they're showing you ads. They're showing you ads that, that are hopefully relevant. And when you click on those, um, they actually monetize that derivative asset. So you are a derivative asset in their books. And they can monetize that through their real customers who are advertisers. And this same model works out whether you are in any kind of a multi-sided scenario. If you were in, a, in an enterprise uh, B2B setting, similarly, you're going to have users who are the employees that might use your, your, your B2B software. And then you've got a decision maker who is buying that software. So the customer is different from the user, but the customer is buying a derivative asset. In this case, they're buying productivity if that software makes people more productive. Um, so that would be how you would kind of think of it. So other kinds of derivative assets could be user-generated content. Uh, I talked about data. So again, you have to figure out what that quid pro quo is. There's no, there's no such thing as a free user in any business model. So when I hear people saying Facebook was free and we're going to be free as well, uh, they weren't. Uh, so they were charging from day one, and they knew what that asset was. And when they report on their, uh, their earnings, they only have to report two numbers. Uh, so the numbers they have to really fundamentally report is the exchange rate. So how, how many how much of this derivative asset do they have, and what is the currency exchange rate to actual dollars? Those are the two numbers they have to really report. And so in the Facebook world, when you see their earnings report, these are the two numbers they really highlight. What is the number of daily or monthly active users? If that number is going up and to the right, then the business model is, is doing well because we're getting more of that asset that we can now trade. The other number they talk about is what is that conversion rate? So what is the average revenue per user? They look at how much money they made in a, in, a, in a quarter divided by the number of monthly active users in that period, and they get the average revenue per user. If that number is going up and to the right, then again, the business model is growing and doing well. And those are the only two numbers they have to show. And of course, to understand why these things are happening, there are secondary metrics, but I'm trying to focus in on what is that single traction metric that you should be using. In this case, it's you know, two of them because there are two sides to that market. So let's shift to the marketplace model. This is a slightly more complicated variant of the multi-sided, simply because we don't just have users and customers. We have a different dynamic here. We have buyers and sellers. And these guys come together. And when they, it's not enough to just make the buyers happy or the sellers happy. What makes this model complicated is you have to bring them together to conduct a transaction. And when they conduct a transaction, that's when value is created here. And that's when you can capture some of that value back in the form of a commission or a finder's fee or something like that. Uh, so the example here that I show is Airbnb, but any of the marketplaces kind of fit that model, whether it's eBay, whether it's uh, Etsy, all of them are kind of in that, in that marketplace model. What makes this complicated compared to the other, other models is that you've got two of everything that you have to be thinking about from day one. In the Facebook model, you can only focus in on the user side. Even if you were doing a B2B sale, if you don't get the value proposition right for the users, the decision makers will never buy the product. The advertisers will not come. Uh, so unless you get that side right, you're not going to get the other side to even be interested. So you can kind of uh, serially tackle the business model. But when we are doing the marketplace, you have to bring both sides together simultaneously to make that work. And that what, that's what makes it more complicated. So I'll throw this one out there. What might, if you have Airbnb up there, what is their traction metric? What is the metric you would use to measure, measure them? The, the number of nights booked, exactly. So it's, it, it's, the answer is right there. It's really fundamentally about the rate of transactions. If that rate of transactions is going up and to the right, uh, which is going very, very much up to and to the right in the Airbnb story, um, that's a business doing really well. So if you just went and said, we have got these many hotel rooms available, that's only half the story. Nobody may book them because the prices are wrong and that's not making the business model work. They only get paid when somebody books a hotel night. And so that's the traction metric you should be reporting on. So the rate of transactions is the key metric here. So this was the first part of the book. I kind of build a bit more on, on how you may use this traction metric to then size a business model. We're not going to talk about that. You can read about that next week. But the thing I wanted to introduce here is that there is a definition of traction for every business model type. And the, the quicker you can kind of hone in on that one metric, 
it at least helps you figure out what your journey looks like. So I'll use a journey metaphor. It's a lot like we are taking a journey from here to kind of an unknown destination. We know we have got to cover 10,000 miles. The traction metric is like your mileage counter. So are we, are we getting closer or not? That's what the traction metric helps you answer. It doesn't help you answer if we are not getting closer, are we going in the wrong direction and why? For that, we have to deconstruct traction. We have to go inside that black box and talk about some of the leading indicators of traction, which is what the second part of the book is about. So the second part is how do we kind of deconstruct traction into its component pieces? How do we identify where we are dropping the bucket or where, where, where we are dropping the ball? And how do we then optimize for getting back on course? So waste is a concept that comes from lean thinking. Those of you that are familiar with the work, um, I have a definition here. It's any activity that consumes resources but adds no value. Um, that comes from lean thinking, which originated originally uh, came from uh, the Toyota production system. And Taichi Ono, who is the father of the Toyota production system, is famous for drawing chalk circles. So you may have heard of the story. He drew chalk circles because he saw something that was inefficient on the factory floor. And he would put his managers in those chalk circles and have them observe the same thing and find the same inefficiency. Not as punishment, but as training exercise. So it was more about trying to teach people to find waste, because it's it, in a well-oiled machine like Toyota is today, very hard to find those inefficiencies. Sometimes it could be that there's a part that's you know, 10 feet away, and if you brought that a bit closer, that itself could increase efficiencies. And then compounded, it actually can have big impacts on their productivity. So it's hard to find waste in a well-oiled machine. I struggle with this concept, so we use a lot of this, this language in the Lean Startup. But when we apply this concept in the startup, it's not a question of finding waste. It's a, really a question of prioritizing waste. So if I talk to any entrepreneur and say, what did you do today? They'll tell me 100 things that they tried to do today. Uh, because there's always hundreds of things we can do, and they're still not satisfied. Because waste is everywhere. We want more customers. We want better websites. We want you know, all better products, faster products. So we try to do all of these types of things. And the question is not so much, how can we improve everything? But how do we really identify what are the right actions at the right time? So how do we focus in on the few key actions that matter and ignore the rest? So in Running Lean, I have this code. This was a code that um, one of my mentors once told me. And I internalized this, but it was a very philosophical code. And Running Lean was a lot uh, kind of built on this, which is at the beginning, when you're starting your products, it doesn't matter what your solution is. You have to start with customers and their problems. Because if you don't get those two things right, your solution is probably going to be wrong, and everything else on your canvas is going to be wrong. So that was the first example of right action, right time. But beyond that, the right action, right time is different for everyone. And so I went looking for another way to talk about what might be a way to prioritize waste or constraints or bottlenecks. I found this body of work by Eliyahu Goldratt. Anyone read this book? Show of hands, a lot of people in this room. That's, that's good. Um, so Eliyahu Goldratt, for everyone else, was an Israeli physicist. He came up with this theory of constraints and then became a business uh, consultant and sold that to a bunch of factory, uh, fa factories and manufacturing plants and, uh, and created a, a pretty interesting business for himself, but also had a very powerful concept, which is worth kind of re-bringing re back. Um, when his book came out, it was very popular. It's still available if you want to pick it up. Um, it's an easy read. It's written as a fictional, non-fiction novel, I guess that's the genre. Um, there's a little story in there, which is a, like a novel, but it has a, it has a non-fiction component to it. Uh, but the big idea in, in his kind of theory of constraint is that when you look at a system like a factory floor, it's not one big process. It's really a system of interconnected machines or interconnected processes. And there's only going to be a single constraint or bottleneck at any given time. So best visualize with the chain. So if I think of my, my, my factory as a chain, there's going to be one slow machine there, which is shown here as the weakest link, the red link. If I apply stress to this business, or if I apply stress to this system, it's not going to break everywhere. It's going to break at that weakest link. And so the thing that matters is us identifying what the bottleneck is and only focusing in on that. I, I draw the analogy that business models are no different. They also are like systems. Uh, they're very interconnected, which we'll see here in a second. And so you have to figure out what is your weakest link in the business model. Already I, I talked about the starting one is obvious. If you don't have your customers and problems right, that is the weakest link. If you don't, if you don't solidify that, everything else will break on, in your business model. Um, the, so if you, if, you, if you don't get that right, we get into the trap of premature optimization. So we start working on those white links, and that doesn't help. 
So if you don't have your customer problem assumption solid and you start building your solution or start worrying about scale, um, you, may, you may have a, a nice TechCrunch article ready to go, but once people come, your product doesn't do anything, and so your business model doesn't start either. So again, those are all examples of premature optimization. The other trap that we often fall into is local optimization. So when we have correctly identified some weak links and we start to fix them and work on them, at some point they no longer become weak links. So we close that. Pretty soon, this is what happens. Now we have to know when to stop. We have to know when to stop optimizing one part of the system and move to the next weakest link. And that's a very important lesson that we often don't, don't do. And you will see that manifested here when I talk about kind of how this applies in the business model. So before we can, pri before we can apply this concept, so I, I, I ran into this work you know, back in the 90s when it first came out and was interesting, but it didn't really resonate. But more recently, when I started thinking of this black box, I draw this analogy of the customer factory. So much like we've got a factory where we are building products, we are also, as entrepreneurs, building customers. And so I began to play with this idea, and the metaphor worked very well. And so that's where I decided to say, let's, let's try to draw a blueprint of what the customer factory looks like. And if we can draw that blueprint universally, we can begin to identify constraints and bottlenecks and apply the theory of constraints to it. So that's what the second, book, the second part of the book really builds on. So I'll kind of talk, I'll show you what's inside the factory. So I, I talked about how building happy customers is the job that we are all up against. Anyone, if anyone disagrees with that, I'd, I'd love to hear that in the questions. Um, but I would say that that fundamentally is what I find every business doing. We all have customers, and we are all in the business of taking customers on the left-hand side and turning them into happy, passionate customers on the right-hand side. Now, the way we do this is with a five-step process. So in this metaphor, I'm going to use Disney World. So imagine Disney World, the theme park is your business. Um, so the first job that you have is bringing people into your theme park, bringing people inside your factory. If nobody ever comes inside, nobody ever leaves, and nothing ever happens. So if you were Disney World, you might do that through the acquisition step. You may do that through advertising, maybe online, maybe paid, uh, maybe on TV or radio. And so you might be driving along and you hear a, Dis a Disney World ad, and they invite you to come and spend time with them, and you decide, next vacation, I'm going to Disney World. So that is you going from being unaware or not interested in Disney World to now becoming interested, and that's the acquisition step. Now, once you show up at, at Disney World, if instead of seeing happy people, you see people in bandages and everyone's crying and, and, and in tears, um, that would be a horrible first experience. And so we want to make sure that that activation step is alive and well and is very healthy. So you want to make sure that your value proposition, what you promised when you acquired that customer, can be realized as quickly as possible. So that's the activation step, the first user experience, not just having them do meaningless work, but rather get them to the value proposition or as close to it as, pro as possible um, so in Disney World, if the rides were really good, you probably will go and explore more of the theme park. And if all the rides are good, you will probably stay there for a while, which is we measure with the retention step. So people don't just go to Disney World for an hour. They usually spend a day and sometimes multiple days. The more time you spend, the more value you create for yourself. And you also give them an opportunity to capture value back from you. So as you are in the theme park, you start to get hungry. You start to buy food and concessions. You start to buy gifts because you get happier along the way. Um, you, have, you, need, you need a place to sleep. You might just uh, rent a hotel from Disney, so that helps uh, there too. So they monetize that as well. And then when you leave and go back home, you tell all your friends because the experience was so good, you'd show them all the pictures and convince them or influence them to also go to Disney World. So this is the five-step blueprint. For some of you in the room, you probably recognize these macro steps. Uh, this is the Dave McClure pirate metrics, even in the first book. I drew it as a funnel, which is how you know, Dave usually talked about it. Um, it's called Pirate Metrics because if you look at the first letter of each of those steps, they spell the word R, which is something uh, pirates like to say. Um, but I, I ran into some issues with when, I, when I was using this as a funnel. Um, one of it is that I found that customers aren't, don't behave like sheep. They, it's, the, the funnel is not linear when we are, when we are modeling customers, but rather nonlinear. The one in, that, that was troublesome in particular was the referral step. So in this picture, I show referral at the bottom, but referral can happen at any part in this process. It can happen after activation, can happen after retention, can happen after revenue. So when you're drawing it as a funnel, it's hard to really know where to place it. Um, the other challenge that I ran is that the funnel just gets very non-emotional. It's just a funnel of you know, top to bottom, and it seems very, very mechanical. You've got a, a big number at the top and a small number at the bottom, 
and we lose kind of the emotion, we lose kind of the customer journey aspect of it. So I kind of redrew that same picture more in this form um, to allow you to kind of uh, get that emotion. So by even having people uh, stick figures with faces on them kind of makes it a bit more real than just a funnel with numbers. So that was the first kind of goal. It was more visual. But the other things that we can talk about some complex concepts much more visually and much more simply with this representation. So where we create value is at that point right there where people get activated. Uh, where we, how we deliver value is by our retention mechanism, what makes them come back and how do we keep delivering ongoing value to them. And then where we capture value is through the monetization engine and which is the revenue shown right there. But two other things I want to highlight here is that there are two very important nodes in this picture. The first one is right there. That's where you have the most number of lines leaving any, any particular node. And that's a causal step. So if you can create happiness in your customers, if you can deliver value to them, you stand to have them come back and use your product more. Uh, they buy more from you, and they also refer your product to other people. What's equally important is the inverse is also true. If you make people unhappy and you make them unhappy enough, they're going to stop using your product, stop buying your product, and they will also leave you referrals, but negative referrals. And you don't want that. Uh, so that's why it is, it's such a powerful thing to measure, and more and more companies are starting to do that. So a company, HubSpot, even devised an index called the Customer Happiness Index. And so they score the retention and engagement in their product, and they have different, uh, they have different scores for different activities, and they can put all their customers on a chart and see which customers are happy and which ones are trailing. And the ones that aren't happy, they deploy uh, their account executives or they use email lifecycle messaging to try to figure out what might be going wrong to save them. What's very freaky with that process is that you can actually predict with uncanny precision when a customer is going to cancel before they even know they're going to cancel. Because if you think about it, we start, we buy products, and then we forget, for, we, we forget about it for a while, so we stop using it. And if you can detect that, you can probably get them to, keep, just to start using the product again, so you can re-engage them. Uh, and so that's a very powerful thing to really measure. Uh, the other thing I'll kind of highlight is that there's, there's a difference between retention and engagement. You can measure retention, but you have to measure the right kind of retention. People may be coming back to your product, but if your product is very hard to use, they may be coming back and getting really unhappy. So, if you, so it's important to build some back channels, whether that's a you know, chat widget or some kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down score, which you see in a lot of apps. But that's a great way of getting the emotion of your customers as they're using your product instead of just relying on are they coming back or not. So those are just some, some little things there. On the left-hand side, so the, so the right-hand side is more important at the earlier stages of a product. You want to make sure that you are creating a nice, happy customer loop. Um, but then when you get to the left-hand side, that's when you start to think about scale. So that's where the concept of the engines of growth kind of kicks in. So, so for us to grow the, the, the business, we need to bring more raw materials in. We need to get more customers created. So some of the ways to do that is you may get, uh, you, you may trigger on the acquisition trigger, so that's the paid engine of growth. You may trigger on the retention trigger to so keep them there longer. That's the re, uh, sticky engine of growth. So you may build additional features or build additional products and get people to consume more from you. And then finally, we have the referral, which can sometimes become a viral engine of growth. And that would be triggering on the referral, referral engine there. So we can explain some of these complex concepts, and that's why this visualization is helpful. But what particularly got me excited is that we can apply the theory of constraints also to this visualization. And that's what I'll kind of end with, which is the last part of, the, of this presentation, is how do we take the customer factory blueprint and use it like a metrics dashboard. So we can take these basic steps and we can apply it to any kind of business. So I, I illustrated this with Disney World, but you can see how if this, was a, if this, if this were a software application, we can describe acquisition in terms of signups. Activation would be the first user experience. Retention would be them coming back and using the product again. Revenue is self-explanatory, and referral might be them adding more people or referring your product to more people. So all businesses have these basic five steps. Some of them don't use all the triggers. So if you were a divorce attorney, for instance, you would not build your business, would not be prudent to build your business around retention because people don't get divorced that often. But you would have to compensate for that. You would have to compensate by either having a good acquisition trigger, so you get new clients coming in, or even better, having a better, uh, having a better referral trigger there. So your so clients who get recently divorced and hire you would then bring more people uh, to hire you as well. 
So we can apply this again at any stage of a product to any kind of a product. So you take these five, five basic steps, and this is a case study that I'm not going to go into great detail because it's, it's, it's documented uh, in the book. Um, but this is a product that we were building. It was a software product, and I mapped some of the steps to it. So this was a very early stage of a product. It was week four of that product. I was running solution interviews, so I was getting people through a landing page, which is what you kind of see here. I had some organic channels. I was getting people to look at a landing page, uh, get interested in the product, tell me they wanted to be interviewed, and then we would get them into an interview. I'd show them the demo, talk about the pricing, and then sign them up. So that would be like your, your, just your direct sales process. We'd sign them up. They would stay with the tool for 30 days, and then they would have an option to upgrade uh, to a paid account, and then that's how we converted them to revenue. And then we were always asking for referrals, which is something you should always be doing from day one. Um, it, even if you're interviewing prospects, you can use that as an effective technique to get to more people that you should talk to. So what we did next is we took this, those, those kind of macro actions, and then we started to collect numbers on them. So in week four, we had 65 visitors who hit our website. Um, out of them, 30, we had 30, less than half of them that, that said they were interested, so that became the leads that we were now able to interview. We began to interview 10 of those people a week, and that's what we did in that particular week. And out of them, only one of them converted. And you can see my goal there, my goal was to get to seven, so I know that this customer factory is not yet working at the capacity I want it to. So this is where we can apply the theory of constraints and try to find where the bottleneck is. So in this particular case, I would argue the bottleneck is right there because that's where we had the most waste happening. Um, and what I mean by that is that all the other steps in here, the, the lead generation and the website, was kind of running 24-7 on its own. We had, we had a landing page up, and we didn't have to expend additional energy to keep that up and running. That was happening automatically. But where we were expending energy was in the interviews. And when we would talk to 10 people and only get a 10% a conversion, that's a pretty dismal conversion rate. So we were only getting one out of 10 people converting, and so we had to figure out what was going wrong. So the idea here, and this is a simple example, but you can apply this even at, even at scale to more complicated examples. But that allows you to now prioritize what really matters. So for us, it was not about getting more leads in here or trying to figure out how to optimize other parts of the story. It was really about asking ourselves why our interview is going wrong. So we actually did a five whys analysis, which is a technique of asking yourself why five times, much like a three-year-old, only you don't go on forever, you stop after some time. Um, so we began to ask ourselves, why are these interviews not converting? And we came up with a bunch of reasons, and some of them were actionable. Um, one of them in particular was that we were talking to the wrong people, because the nine people who we talked to uh, were too early, some were too late, and the one that bought was you know, just right. So we figured out what, was, what were some of the things about that person that was different, and we decided to implement that first. Not during the interviews, we decided to implement them at the time when we were getting the leads. So we began to qualify the leads. Um, so we, when people would say, we like your product, we want to be interviewed, we'd give them a three-part questionnaire to, to answer. And based on the results of that, we would decide to either interview them or politely say, you're too early or, or, or not early enough for us. And we'll contact you when the, when the time is right. And what do you expect happen? So once you qualify leads, what typically happens? better conversion on the, on the bottom line, but in the short term, we actually have poor conversion, right? And that's the point that I want to raise here, is that when you qualify leads, the number of leads are going to drop, because not everyone's going to match your criteria, because you're now asking, you're, you're beginning to put a filter to your lead process. And this is the point that I want to really highlight with this example, is that when you focus in on the local maxima, when you, when you, sorry, when you focus in on a local KPI or local metric, um, you can sometimes lose sight of the system throughput of the overall goal. And so in this example, if I, was, if I were broken out into departments, this, it would seem like the first two departments were doing bad because our number of interviews went down, number of leads went down. But because we qualify the leads better, the conversion rate at the end, the bottom line, actually went up. And so it's a very simple example, but this problem manifests itself in large companies all over the place, even in, in startups all over the place. And we see this as the premature optimization or the local optimization trap. So salespeople, we incentivize them in large companies in terms of number of sales they close. It's no surprise that the last month is where they close the most number of sales because they've got a deadline, they've got to meet their quota. That by, the, by itself is not bad. One company, HubSpot, who I mentioned early on, began to study uh, the, the, the close rate, the, the, the times when people would close and the impact on customer lifetime. And what they found is that 
customers who were closed at the last week of the month also churned much, much more. Um, and sometimes when they looked even further, they found that it's because the salespeople were getting a bit desperate. They were using aggressive sales tactics. They were misrepresenting the product. They just wanted to close the deal so they could get their commission. And that helps them with their local KPI, but doesn't help the business. And so HubSpot has a very simple, had a very simple policy fix. They just said that salespeople cannot collect their commissions until 90 days after the customer has been retained. Because in the SaaS world, after 90 days, people have kicked all the tires and they're not going anywhere, at least for a while. So it was not, so, so they essentially redefined the job of the salesperson, not just to close the sale, but to make sure that customers were closed in the right way. And that's how they fixed that. So I'm, I've used the sales example, but this applies in every, in every context. Not too long ago, we would incentivize developers to write more lines of code, because we thought more code was better code. And that is kind of silly now. Um, the other thing we used to do was incentivize them in, in, in terms of the number of bugs they fixed. And the smarter developers actually wrote their own bugs and then made them very latent and fixed them when, when, it, when the pain was so high and collected their bonus checks. Um, you can go to marketers and say, give me more leads. And the marketers will say, What's, how, much, you know, how much money do you want to spend? And they can give you all the leads in the world, but the leads may not be converting leads. So again, I bring that up because it's a very simple concept. But the point of all of that is that when you focus just on a single metric, uh, that has been a mantra for a long time, that's only part of the answer. So you want to use the constraint to identify where the constraint is, but the fixes may not be there. The fixes may be further upstream, like in the example I showed. More importantly, you have to focus on a single metric, but you have to look at the overall output of your customer factory. So you have to give yourself enough time to measure those long-term effects uh, to make sure that what you are really doing does really add up. So that was a preview. We'll kind of go into Q&A for how much ever time we have left. Um, so maybe just a reminder, the book will be out next Tuesday. All of you, thank you for supporting the book. Um, you will get a copy in the mail. So I've got all your addresses. If you, if you, sometimes people fill out forms and put in dummy addresses. If you have one of those, send me an email. Uh, we can still fix it. Um, so I want to make sure you do get the book. So I don't have the book to give you today, uh, but I do have some Lean Canvas stickers. So if you're interested, you can come by and get them. Um, I've got uh, I, maybe not, not one for everyone, but they're so, so just come up and get those. Um, these are maybe just to, get, just to kind of t talk a little bit about them. They glow with the Apple logo, so they will kind of light up. And if you miss the Apple logo, they are removable. So you can peel them off <laughs> um, and give it to someone else. So don't throw it away, but give it to someone else, which is the next best thing you can do. So again, before I end, maybe one final key takeaway, which is what I consider the secret to practicing all of this. Um, and that is that we all pay a lot of, uh, uh, we, we, we give a lot of attention to perseverance and grit. We have to be determined. We have to go and push our ideas out. But if we are only focusing on the solution box and trying to brute force a solution, that's not the right way to go about building things. So if you start with a solution, it's a lot like starting with the key. You have built the key, but you don't know what door that's going to open. And so a much better way, a much better strategy for finding the, the right doors to open is not starting with the solution, but rather falling in love with the problem. So if you can find customers you want to serve or a big problem you want to solve, if you start there and start poking around, the doors become apparent that you want to go through, and the keys also become apparent. So that's all I have. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Ash. <laughs> Thanks for an awesome talk. Um, Go with your doors and keys. You're going to be, I'm going to call you the key master, <laughs> like from the Matrix. The Matrix. The key master I'm, I'm very influenced by All the right, Matrix. All right, cool. Yeah. So we've yeah. got two mics running. If you want to um, ask a question, hold up your hand, wait for a mic. If you get the mic, uh, they'll tell you whether you're up next or you have to wait for the next person, okay? We'll, we'll uh, reward the front row seat. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, I really like your stuff. Uh, I'm wondering, I know you've uh, mentioned in passing various places jobs to be done. And uh, could you say some more about how that relates to what you've been talking about tonight? And uh, also, if, what you think about uh, what customers want, which I'm sure you've read that book by Ulrich. Yes. Yeah, so I, I've, I became a, a convert with the jobs to be done framework. So I, as you can tell, I, I talk a lot about problem. Uh, but one of the traps that I find, uh, that I see people falling into, is that when I say take the solution out of your mind, it's impossible to do. So people will, will pretend that they've taken the solution out of their mind, and they will go to the problem box and write the problems in terms of the solution, uh, right? So if I'm building a photo sharing app, it's obviously because photo sharing is hard. And so you will just kind of back away from the solution. And so I find the jobs is a very refreshing way of getting to the problems without starting with problems. So the basic concept of the jobs to be done framework, and you can look this up, it was 
a term that was uh, uh, popularized, not coined, but popularized by Clayton Christensen in his book, Innovator Solution. But some of the consultants who, who, did, who did the work, um, they, they are with the Rewired Group, and I've had kind of the privilege to work with them. And I found that it was very refreshing because you start out by asking what jobs are customers trying to do. So the basic metaphor is that people are trying to make some progress in their lives, so they're trying to get somewhere. If you can identify what that is, you then figure out what are they doing today. So how are they getting that job done? Um, what are the existing alternatives, which would be on the Lean Canvas? And then from there, you figure out where the problems lie. So are they achieving the goal? If they're achieving the goal, there may be no room for innovation. But if they aren't achieving the goal, and they're doing something that is, that is you know, more expensive or harder, and, they're not at, and, and, and that's where the space for innovation lies, and that's where your product fits in. So it's just a different way of coming out to it, and I find it, it disarms people because they start thinking about how do I build better results for customers, and then what problems do they have achieving those results, and that's where the problems lie. So I think it's just, I, I'm a big fan of that work, and, and even the book that you mentioned, I think it's a, it's, uh, there, there's a few books that are coming out on jobs to be done uh, as well, and so I think that will be encouraging and, and helping, helping spread that. A uh, question over here. Yep. Uh, again, uh, great talk and love your books. Thanks. Uh, Lean Canvas used it uh, successfully. <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, going back to one of your slides where you were asking the five whys mm -hmm. in your SaaS product. Um, sure. So the first, price too high, right? And that led to don't understand the value proposition. I kind of got stuck with that. Sure. Because that was key to you finding out, hey, I need to screen these people better so that they're more sophisticated. Um, how did you arrive at the second why? Uh, what were the mechanics of, of actually getting somebody to say, hey, I don't understand your value proposition? Seems like yeah. something like that. Users tend to not reveal uh, stupidity or ignorance about something. So. Well, so yeah, so for, for us it was really, so, so the way that I found that, and this is a technique that I started doing in all my interviews, is that I always thought people would compare apples to apples. So we had a product that was $200 a month, and we were selling it to technical software founders. So that is an expensive product, even I will tell you that. Um, so when we first brought that number out, people just said, you're crazy, right? So that's, that was the first reaction. They were not understanding the value proposition of the product. And then we'd ask them why. Like, why, why do they think that's so expensive? Like, you know, just playing that along with them. And they would say, well, I don't spend that on anything. Like, our most expensive product is $100 a month. We're like, well, what does it do? And it was trouble ticket software. But we were building analytic software which could help them make or break their business. And so we felt like they weren't getting the value proposition right. So that's where that kind of came from. And part of the solution is, uh, this is something that I've, I've done some, some blog posts around, is that you, I found that it's very effective to explicitly anchor your pricing. Don't think your customers can do that apples to apples comparison. And speaking of Apple, I, I got inspired by watching Steve Jobs on stage because he was uh, introducing the iPad price and he was comparing it to the netbook. The netbook was $1,000, but the Apple was not going to be a thousand, the iPad was not going to be $1,000. It was going to be half that. And everyone got really happy in the room. And when I saw that, I said, if he can do this on stage, I could probably do it with one person. At worst, they'll say no to me again. So that's not too bad. And I found the equivalent. So for me, the analytics product was about helping their business grow. Uh, many of them were spending 20 hours upwards on their own analytics dashboards. And so I just asked them a simple question after they said I was crazy, is that if you could build the same product I just demoed you with, at four developer hours a month, which is what $200 a month roughly translated to, then you come out ahead. So that was how we turned that around in the next you know, two weeks worth of, of, of experimenting. But in this example, the easier thing to do was us, for us to, was to qualify some of those leads. Because some of the, the, the other low-hanging fruit was we were just talking to the wrong people. So it wasn't even about price. They were just too early for us. Some of them hadn't even launched their products. They liked the value proposition, but they wouldn't need it for another three to six months. And so it was no point talking to them. All right. Um, I had a question about the KPIs. So this has been um, a really good discussion about really diagnosing what really matters. And these businesses are run, they're embedded with wrong KPIs. So how far up the food chain do you have to go and how difficult uh, a task will you have to tell a business, you're doing it all wrong, <laughs> you're measuring the wrong metrics, yeah. you need to readjust this, and how much pushback and um, how high up do you have to do to actually get them 
to get with it? Yeah, so, so, so it's a great question, and I think it, it has to start, it, so Eric Ries coined the term innovation accounting, and so it, it starts with kind of having that, that language of innovation accounting be embedded, um, not just with the, with the so, but so I, I assume when you're talking, you're maybe talking corporates who get really big and they start doing these, these but even startups can get big and they start doing these types of things. And so I think it just starts with an awareness of simple examples like this and knowing this problem exists. With products that are very big, I just did a workshop the last two days in a corporate environment, and it had room, it was a room full of stakeholders and entrepreneurs, but these were accelerators, uh, accelerator type people inside a corporate setting. And so there, there's more hope because they were willing to use different metrics to measure their, their innovation um, versus a more established product. So I would say that's where I find the conversation has to start somewhere, and it's going to take a long time to take your existing products to shift into this mindset, although the earlier the better. But I feel like the low-hanging fruit, the early adopters, are really, really people who are starting out, and it's not that they don't have the other metrics, it's that those metrics don't work. Um, so when you're first starting out, things like ROI or, or revenue are non-existent, so you don't even have those metrics, and so the only metrics they rely on our execution of a plan. Are we building things on time and on budget? And if you're building something nobody wants on time and on budget, it only proves that you get there on time and on budget. So no, one's, no one wants that. And so when you put it in that context, they're willing to try these types of things. And to me, that's the, the early adopter route. And if they can show success with this, we can maybe get others to start thinking more this way. Um, I really like the example of the food truck, but I didn't catch like what did they do differently. Yeah, so I, I would say what what is different is that most most restaurateurs would um, would jump towards the brick and mortar restaurant. So the thing they feel they need to get is the best location for their restaurant. Um, they would you know have to probably take out a loan um, or get investment to kind of build that up. And to me, that's how uh, how many of the restaurants restaurateurs used to get started kind of pre some of these faster ways to test the idea. Um, so with this approach, you can go out there with the food truck, you can go out there and test your concept and change it up every day. The MVP for food is a few hours worth of cooking. If it doesn't work, you change the recipe and try the next day. In a brick and mortar restaurant, more expensive to that, do that kind of experimentation. Uh, many of those, I didn't finish the story, but many of those uh, restaurants that I showed up there kept their food trucks around because that is still their fast innovation ground. That's still where they're trying out new things. In Austin, we have got food trailer parks, and so you have a, you have a, you have a tr you have early adopter foodie traffic that's coming in there with the expectation of trying something new and daring, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, and that's the perfect test audience. So if it, they can change their recipe every week, uh, and if it if something sticks, they then put it into their brick and mortar restaurant, and otherwise it just dies a silent death. So that's that's what's kind of different in that in that model. I have a question. Yep. Um, do you see a distinction between a happy customer and an emotionally loyal customer? Huh. Emotionally loyal. And, and why, why, why would maybe help me see that? Well, emotionally loyal would be more, I love it, I'll never use anything else. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing they consider. And a happy customer could be, I'm happy with the cafeteria food. I go there, it's convenient. I tell you I'm there, it's more of my behavior, but I could leave tomorrow. It seems okay. like that's potentially a distinction. Okay, there. if you def if you define and it that, that way, I would say. It would matter because you would measure and it would affect your retention and everything. Yes, and as I say, if you define it that way, I would be more in the first camp of your definition, so I'd want an emotionally loyal so they're retained. At the same time, I will, I will qualify that as that not, not everyone can be retained forever, for, for, forever. So using the jobs metaphor, uh, this is a lesson I learned. So with, we have a Lean Canvas online tool, and I expected people to stay with us for two years because that's what I needed for my business model to work. And I found people were, were leaving after six months. And so I picked up the phone and asked them, you know, what's wrong? Why, what are we doing wrong? Why are you leaving, leaving us? And I said, oh, we love the product. We just were done with it, right? So they had done their canvases. They had done enough iterations, and there was nothing else to do, so they left. And so to me, again, you, you just have to be... So for us, the thing was... How do we now retain that customer and add more jobs for them to do? Not, and, and so I, I, was still looking at, I would still look at creating a happy customer. They were happy and satisfied when they left, but how can I keep them there and, and increase that lifetime? So we're kind of saying the same things, but if you use that label, I would say the first one matches the definition more closely to what I was trying to get across. 
Yes. I'm Rosemary. Thanks for sharing your work. What portions of this model changes when you're trying to productize professional services? So from my experience, not that much. So even in professional services, so, so in my own business, I do a, a bunch. So we build software, I write books, but I also do consulting and workshops. So I, I see everything kind of fitting in. So I don't, I don't think that that much changes, but I think that depending on your goal, so um, depending on your goal, your strategy for growing the business might change. So when I first started my company, um, I, I was driven more by the number of people that I could reach with, with some of the, the work that I do. And I made a, a conscious, I first tried to clone myself, which is what everyone tries to do. Let's get more, more of the same. Let's get more speakers and more writers. And that worked for a little while, but it was not very, very scalable. And I also didn't want to build a professional services organization. So that's where, for me, I still use professional services, but use it very strategically. I use it more to learn, and I replace that learning, kind of like if you're familiar with the concierge model. I'll go and do workshops. I'll do high-touch experiences. But the learning that I get from that, I try to productize that in other ways. So that might be a book. That might be software. That might be other, other types of things. If you look at some of the products we have, you will see a, a theme running through them is there's a lot of learning that we get from the prof professional services side of the business, but it fuels everything else that we do. So again, I don't think that by itself professional services is any different. You still have the same steps. You, know, you would still have business, business development, and that would be your acquisition. Then you would have to have something that makes that deal go through. You'd have the retention. Do they come back and buy more from you? The referral is still there. So those steps are all there. But when you start asking yourself, if I want to 10x my business, do I hire 10 times as many people, or do I try to productize what I'm doing? And to me, that's where some of the, the differences uh, kind of come into play. Yes, Sean. Just, just a comment. Uh, I like happy, but if you wanted to use the Kano model, you could talk about satisfied, delighted, uh, dissatisfied, and don't meet the definition. And that might be a more robust way sure. to look at it. Sure. Thanks. Yes. Ash, great talk. Uh, two things you pointed out were don't fall in love with your <laughs> ideas and uh, beware of local maxima. Yeah. Um, I sat in a session uh, with Bernie Maloney where he had us go ahead and make uh, some canvases. And he had us spend 10 minutes on it. And then he had us tear it up <laughs> and start another one and do that a couple of times. Can you comment on uh, some cases, perhaps, where people maybe stopped a little too soon and didn't tear up their canvas? and do another one. Do you have any case studies or sure? Uh, well, uh, yes. I mean, so so it, it is something that is very important. And so the idea, maybe if I if I put some context around it, the local maxima problem is that if you create a canvas, um, you can you, you, you can fall in love with a business model which may be a small part of a much bigger story. And so the image, and we sometimes I come from a from a engineering background. So in mathematics or computer science, we talk about the hill climbing problem. And so the image there is you being blindfolded into a landscape and asked to find the highest point in that landscape. If there are hills and mountains, you can stumble your way and get on top of a hill and declare you're the highest point. But when you take off the blindfold, there's this neighboring mountain next to you. So when people prematurely create a canvas and don't ask the, you know, don't play with it. Right? That's why I like the Lego analogies. When you build something with Lego, you can kind of take it apart and, and do other things with it. And that's what I often will do in, in the workshops, is people will create their initial canvas We'll look at it, critique it, but then there should be a, a part where we start to take a step back and ask a bunch of what-if questions. Uh, in your case, you were, you were tearing it up and doing it all over again. Um, but even if you just start remixing and playing the boxes and say, what if the segment were different? Or what if instead of an annual subscription we did monthly or we, we charged it, had a completely different model, a multi-sided or marketplace model? Um, those are the types of questions one should be asking. So in the book, I also do a, um, I, I do a business model sizing exercise. And that's very helpful in also invalidating ideas, is that you may have an idea, but once you do some of the back of the envelope calculation, you realize this will never get you there. And so that automatically forces you to come and either fix that idea or come up with a new one. Um, so, so I do find that to be a trap. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very dangerous trap because people get the impression that they've got the business model down, not the business model story. They get outside the building. And as we know, talking to people just takes time. And so several weeks go by, and then they realize that the idea may never really achieve a goal, 
are maybe too small and they're, they're kind of in a local maxima. So I do, I'm a big fan, if, you've, if you follow some of the lean kind of thinking, there's a, another loop called the PDCA loop, plan, do, check, act. Um, and I feel that the planning part is something that we, in our exuberance for action in the lean startup, we sometimes don't spend enough time doing. Um, there's this, this attitude of let's go out and build, let's go out and measure, let's go out and learn. But you need to do some of that planning work, and that, that falls in that category in my, in my mind. I have, a, I have a question. So I had a question about the value part. Uh, you mentioned about value. So once you create this value, you sell them. There's a good product market fit. You sell the product. The problem in our situation, like a company which is in a growth phase now, uh, the problem that arises is that then the customer starts doing a parity with existing products which are in the market. The value is probably a differentiator, but the problem arises to retain these kind of customers because then we are not like we are comparing ourselves with mature product or you know companies who've been around in that space. How do you handle that kind of situation? Because I haven't seen uh, too many people talk about that, but that's my everyday challenge. That you know, <laughs> uh, okay, this product, so and so product had this, 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 and you guys have this, which is awesome, but you don't have this, 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 and yeah. they don't have that. Uh, what do you call it? They don't want to wait because they're already looking at something or they were comparing us with something which is out there for uh, and has matured to that level. Yeah. I mean, a classic so, example could be some of these things that are like pretty been there around like so. Sure. So I, I think fundamentally it's a question of what, what kind of business you want to build. So there, there are many businesses that are okay with letting their customers outgrow them and helping them transition off to something else. So you, have, you want to figure out, do you want to be the best at kind of that, uh, the way you're describing it, maybe there's a value proposition that gets people started, but they reach a point where they start wanting more and needing more. So you either have to step up and satisfy that need, or you just happily tell them, you know, we are done with you and go on to something else. So you have to ask yourself, can you grow the business model sufficiently to meet your goal with the value proposition you have today? And if you have that and you've hit product market fit, and I would probably encourage you to focus more on scaling that business model first rather than just trying to be trying trying to move the the, the, the line of what product market fit really means. So I don't know if that that made sense. Um, so so you, you have customers who are coming with you and they're using your product. Um, are there more of those types of people? Can you go and acquire more of those types of people and make the business model work instead of trying to compete in a in a bigger space? It goes through. I mean, it's definitely the value is there at that point that, yes, you are uh, different. You're solving the exact problem. But the moment there is adoption on implementation, and actually I'm talking about a SaaS product, which is in a, in a space which has been around, but it's like it's different in a way that it's more suited for this. Um, maybe we can have this offline. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but the problem really ar arises is when they start adopting it. And then they've used something in the past, and they see that, OK, let's, uh, the, the really uh, problem that I'm seeing is that how do we retain? How do, they, how do we keep them happy at that point, right? Because they need to have that appetite to kind of wait for us to uh, reach to that To, to get, so, get there. So. Yeah, so, so I, I think maybe we can talk afterwards, because maybe in that case, the, value prop, the MVP or the value proposition that you have in the beginning is just not sufficient to to, 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 to to basically make the business model work. And you may have to figure out a either a different small value proposition that is so differentiated that people will still come and use you, or you have to get big like the others. But the danger with getting big like the others is you look a lot like them. And the, unless the switching, co the switching cost gets in the way, people will trust something they already know versus try you that are doing the same exact thing. Um, so we can maybe talk offline and, and get more specifics on, on, your, on your business. Yes. So I was struck before when you were talking about your customers being satisfied, but sooner than you expected. Yes. And so then you were talking about um, delivering more value, presumably by finding other needs that they had that you could meet. And that contrasts with a model that seems to be getting a huge amount of play now that I think the focus of the dialogue probably is around Near Isle's book Hooked versus uh, recently I encountered the work of Tristan Harris, Time Well Spent, where he's kind of looking at the how to unhook yourself, basically. 
Uh, so in those situations, rather than creating satisfied customers, you're really kind of creating perpetually dissatisfied customers, in a sense. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, so I think you're, you're, so when you talk about the habit forming types of products, um, yeah, so it would be interesting that you classify them as dissatisfied because I think they get dissatisfied multiple times, but it's maybe un, un, unsatiable, insatiable yeah. customers. Right, I mean, some people have called it addiction. Sure, sure. So yeah, so I, I, I mean, there are habit forming products, but I, I think again, if you look at the utility, some of those, some of those behaviors, which is, you know, like we talk about, like if you use Facebook as an example or Instagram, some of those behaviors kind of are, are daily things that people do. And so when they become part of those, those habits, there's still value being created because they are getting um, you know, those, those highs and lows that the hooked model kind of talks about. But it's just one of those things where the recurring use of that is a very long period of time. And that's why it, it gives you that impression. While with many of the B2B or software products, you may get those effects, but sometimes there are finite, like with the Lean Canvas, there are finite uh, usage models for it. Although I would add that uh, you know, I'm currently reading the book Deep Work. I don't know if you've encountered that yeah. one. And he's talking about actually the deleterious effects of you know, things like Twitter and sure. you know, checking Facebook all the time and how it really actually reduces net value. To, yeah, I, I, can, sure. I can see that. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't defend you know, that because I also try to cut my time on those types of things. Um, but, but yes, but, but, I, but I would say that um, like I think you can, you can create, like I, I look at habit forming products as maybe potentially even a tactic, but you still have a responsibility. And I think Nier does a pretty good job of saying, you know, this is like, the, like a Jedi mind trick. You have to use it in the right way because you can create these detrimental effects. But if we use them in the right way, you can create more engagement for your products, but hopefully you're doing it kind of responsibly. Yes. Thanks for a great presentation and some really inspiring work. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have some uh, very basic questions. So you mentioned that we should l fall in love with the problem, not the solution. But yep. how do you determine whether the problem is big enough or worth solving to begin with? Yes. So that's where some of the Especially sizing if you things. you don't have resources and kind of are really starting out. Yeah. Well, so I, I would say that's where some of the sizing of the business model comes. I can give you a very high level um, kind of view of that. So, so for me, it, it's. It fundamentally starts with what do you as the innovator, the maker, the entrepreneur want to get out of your business model. And sometimes that could be a revenue goal, it could be an impact goal, but it's getting to your deeper why. So if you've seen Simon Sinek's talk, I'm a big fan of, of, of that message. You start with your why and then that's your vision and then the how is the strategy. So that's kind of the, the lean canvas and how you're going to validate it. That's kind of what you, what you describe there. And the what's are all the little things you do along the way. So your day-to-day -day experiments that you run to get you to that point. But I often will tell people to start with those whys. And sometimes they are, they are misaligned. So I've, I've seen people, it's like we have couch surfing. I've seen people accelerator surfing. Um, I was in Chile and I met the team. I went to Denmark and they were there in a different accelerator. And then I was in Arkansas and then they were there as well. Um, and I actually sat them down and said, you know, your idea is not going to get funded. And what are, you, what are you guys doing? And they were just using accelerators as, a, as, a develop, as funding their development. But you have to fundamentally ask yourself, is that really worth doing? You're going all over the world, spending all this time. In my book, time is the scarcest resource. So you want to figure out, in, in your case, either kill that idea off or go bootstrap it and really focus in. Don't be going through all the distractions of pitches and all the things you have in accelerators. Just figure that thing out. So that is, again, more of a qualitative answer to what, what you're asking, uh, but it starts with that. Once you figure out what that why is, then you can, act if, ideally, if it's like a revenue number, we can take the inputs in the lean canvas, like your pricing model, life, like all these five metrics I talked about, we can take that and, and create a model which can prove or disprove whether your business model can achieve your goal. And so I have one entrepreneur in particular, he came to me and said, yes, I have a big ambition. I want to build a $100 million uh, exit product because that's what yeah, kind of pushes him, that's what inspires him. And he had a problem space. He was trying to do something in the gluten allergy space. And he was considering many different ideas within it, but he created over half a dozen to a dozen canvases by the end of it and invalidated each one of them and eventually found one that could potentially get him to that goal. And that's the one he started working on more diligently. So it requires that kind of discipline. If you, have, if you want to find problems worth solving, you have to start with what is your end goal? So I have a code in the book, the, it's an adapted Alice in Wonderland code. 
if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so you have to first start out with that end in mind, and then you can figure out all these other things and use these techniques to, to hopefully get you there. Do you think a total addressable market is sort of a good thing Not, to get in the beginning? And do you have any insights into what would be sort of a minimum yeah. market that would kind of present a problem worth solving? And I'm sorry. No, no that's, that's fine. I mean, I think that, that's a valid question, and I think it's good for everyone. But total addressable market is the top down sizing model. So this is where we say it's a billion dollar market. I just need, I'm not going to be greedy, just 1% will do. And so this should work. Um, I find that that's a very misleading way of thinking about the problems worth solving. It's much better to go bottoms up. So for your value proposition, tell me who your early adopters are. Tell me what your pricing model is. And I can tell you if it will be a billion dollar idea. And it probably will not, will not match up that way. So I'm more a fan of bottoms up thinking. Take the inputs versus the top down. And you will get to a much better, uh, more actionable set of, set of uh, ac uh, open action plan. All right, let's take two more questions, and then we can stick around for sure after that, too. <laughs> can you scare them off? <laughs> he drops so much knowledge, your brains are exploding. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let's stop there. I'm, Ash, I'm sure we'll stick around for a little bit to do one-on-one -on -one questions. Let's give away some thanks. Thank give him a round of applause. <laughs>